We've been asking this question over these last days. Where is it? What is this place in which we find ourselves when the mind no longer has any recourse to finding a roost on which to rest on any of the three levels of existence. For example, and without any aspersion or derision on anyone who still uses these kinds of roosts. For instance, on the egoic level, someone who says, I'm Joe Blow the scientist and everything has a scientific answer. The answers are all in science. Or when someone has a problem or a question on that arcane level, uh, they will come back immediately to say, I'll just, I'll just check with the tarot clouds or the runes or I'll look in the stars, or I'll go and visit my astrologer, or my clairvoyant. Or on that uh, sublime level, so-called, uh, where we believe that everything is interrelated and everything is one, so we inevitably come back to the answer, oh well, that's the universe's business, or that's God's business, that will be taken care of. So what happens when we have no recourse to any of those three roots for our mind to come to rest on? That's been the question that's been asked of us. And there's a story that enables another question to be posed in relationship to this. And it's a story about a young man by the name of Brava Malu. Now, Brother Malu was a very handsome, virile, and rich young merchant in a flourishing town that was situated on the banks of a river. But Brother Malu was totally and absolutely besotted, in love with, with every atom of his being, with a beautiful young courtesan that lived on the other side of the river. And every opportunity, he would go to bask in her loveliness, her alabaster skin, the wrapped in her beautiful arms, and the bliss that all of that brought. He could hardly think of anything else. And one day in the mid-afternoon, the desire was too great for him. He dropped everything that he was doing and off he went to be in the arms of his beloved. But as it so happened, a very great storm had come up. And by the time he reached the banks of the river to find a boatman to take him across to the house of his beloved son, Chintamani was her name. None of the boatmen would take him. The river was running fast and had come up over the banks, even over the docks. He went from boatman to boatman to boatman, but some of them had gone home because there was no point in staying around to try to ferry people in this kind of storm. And those who were there just said, don't be stupid, you drown in that kind of way, we're not taking you across. So it was a very great disappointment. Brother Malu went back to his house, but the desire was too great. The love welled up in him. He had to go. So he went down to the river. He dove into the water and began to swim. But the current was too great and he found himself under the water, struggling even to survive very rapidly being borne down along the rushing torrent. But very fortunately, he groped, and as he was groping, he felt what he thought was a log that was passing by. So he grabbed its spongy mass, and he, with great strength and 
tenacity, he guided himself over to the banks of the river. He dragged what he thought was a log up so that he could use it to get back across the river again. And then he made his way to Tindamani's house. But when he got there, he went to the front door and it was locked. He went to the back door and it was locked also. Of course, the windows were barred. He had no way to get in. But in the very faint light that there was as the storm was still pelting, he saw what he thought was a piece of rope hanging from her balcony. Oh, the love surged up in him. She's left a piece of rope so that I can climb to her, he thought. So, holding onto the piece of rope, he clambered up, climbed over the balcony. And there in the faint light was his beloved lying asleep. So, he went over to her very gently caressing her cheek. He bent down to kiss her. But of course he was dripping with water and the water drops falling on her woke her. She looked up and said, Brother Malu, how did you come? This great storm, how? He said, my love for you is so great. There was nothing that could keep me from you. But the house was locked. How did you come in? Oh, he said, thank you, thank you for leaving the rope for me. She said, but I didn't leave a rope for you. So she said, let's see. So she lit her oil lamp and they went over. And there, its tail coiled around the balcony, was a great cobra, cold from the storm hanging there. And the man said, but you could have been killed. I didn't see. Didn't you feel its sliminess? No, I didn't notice. All I wanted was to be with you. And then she said, how, how, did, you, how did you get here? And he told her the story. I was being tumbled down the river, and then I found a log. She said, let's go and see. So they're taking the lamp, they went down, and there was the dead body of a peasant who drowned in the river. And she said, didn't you see? He said, my love for you is so great. But of course, a great wave of shame and flowed through him. But when they entered Gentleman's chamber once again, she looked at Brother Mali with tears rolling down her face. She said, Beloved Brother Mali, your love for me is too great. I am impure. My beauty will fade. But your love is pure. If only you would turn your love to God, all would be given to you. Something happened in that moment of the brother and Something shifted within him. He said to say that to me again. So she again repeated the sequence of events that had taken place. Look, look how powerful this love is that carried you across a raging torrent, unable to even be aware of what it was that it was occurring to you. Only your knowledge and your love for me keeping you. And in that moment, Brother Madhu knelt down and kissed him to Mani's feet and left. Immediately he returned to his village and casting aside his worldly possessions, he went to the temple 
where he donned the garb of a monk and began to practice a mantra. Several years passed. One day, he looked up from his task and his mantra. And there was a woman with long black hair cascading down her back, her beautiful sari waving as she walked. Send money. The desire rose up in him once again and he followed the maiden until she came to a doorway and turned and of course Brother Malu saw that it was not his beloved Tentamani. But the maiden said to him, What is it that you want of me? Brother Malu, with tears in his eyes, said, Please, would you bring me two needles? When she did so, Brother Malu used those two needles to pierce his eyeballs. From that moment on, Brother Malu became a blind poet and a great teacher. Looking to our question, where do we find ourselves? What is this place when our mind no longer has recourse to any of the roots that those levels of existence offer to us and we know them well? We've had to use them ourselves on our journey the ways of the ego, the ways of the arcane or the intuitive or the magic or the, and even the ways of oneness and enlightenment, interrelatedness. How does this story then? <coughs> Perhaps bring some gleaning of understanding of this place. What is the meaning of piercing our eyes? Relative to this place, this state, what does it mean, this story for you? Getting rid of any temptation that's getting in the way of between us and God, but then can't God be a root too? We have to take this story to another level and it's symbolism. What is this love, this God that we speak of? What is it that's there in us when all else has been taken away? What is it that's aware that it's aware? What is it that's unchanging when all else changes? We give it names and the stories give it, the, make the metaphors and the symbols, but we know their meaning. So this is why the question is asked, symbolically, what does it mean to pierce our eyes? Hmm. 
to not look outside anymore. Not look outside anymore. Mm. The answers are not to be found out there. And out there is anything to do with the mind. Because the mind is conditioned by the experiences of the past, whatever they might be. Before we might have been a dead leaf blowing in the wind, but now we're at a stand, so we have nowhere else to be but here. But where is here? Where is here? Where is here when the mind has no foundation on which to live? I'm Joe Blow, the scientist who studies psychology and, and embraces oneness. can't identify ourselves with any set any anything at all. But it's like just getting an email. You no longer have to go through the Yes, one. 